Hey, hello everybody. I'm going to start a little bit earlier, because then I can maybe do about four minutes more talking. Well, I'll keep talking until I get kicked off the stage, so we'll maybe do ten minutes more talking. Uh, so, hello everybody, I'm James Dragon. Welcome to um, my talk on Jenkins X. Uh, so, let's get cracking, and I'll see how many demos I can squeeze into 25 minutes. Uh, so, before I start, how many people have read the Accelerate book? The Accelerate book? Anybody read this book? A couple of people? A couple of people? So. You should all read this book. I know it's in English, but you should all read this book. It's awesome. Uh, so who, how many people have heard of the State of DevOps report? State of DevOps report? Okay, a few more people. So the State of DevOps report has been going for four or five years, and it's been surveying anybody who does DevOps about what are the best, uh, what practices do high-performing teams do? So what do low-performing low teams do, medium and high-performing teams do? And the basic aim is to try to find out what are those practices that high-performing teams do. And the basic idea is every team should be able to become a high-performing team. Now, one of the reasons you're at DevOps microservices is microservices is one way to go faster, right? It's one way of delivering value faster. If you have a large monolith and lots and lots of people, one way of going faster is splitting the monolith into small microservices so you have lots of separate parallel teams, and each team can then go faster. So microservices is one of these best practices. Uh, this Accelerate book is, is full of a ton of different things and patterns and approaches to make your team go faster. So I highly recommend you buy this book. I didn't write it. It's nothing to do with me. I don't get commission. But please buy the book. It's really, really awesome. One of the little facts in the book is this one. Um, some teams have been found to be 2,600 times faster than low-performing teams. Like, we've all heard of the 10x developer, and people have said, there's no such thing, and the 10x developer makes 10x the tech debt, and all this kind of stuff. Um, this survey has found some teams are 2,000 times faster. Now, imagine you're working in a slow-performing team, and a high-performing team starts accelerating past you at 2,600 times the speed. Just think of how much value they will be building. Like, your business is going to go bust, right, within a year or two, right? Each year is, like, a couple of decades for them, right? So we all need to get better and become high-performing teams. Now, you've probably heard of some of these. Um, here's a few of the, the principles from the book. What we've tried to do with Jenkins X is take a lot of the principles in the Accelerate book and the recommending practices, which are the high-performing teams' practices, and we've tried to automate them with open-source code so that you can go faster without worrying about how to do it all. So a couple of them. I'll just read a few of these out. Use version control and version your artifacts and use version control for your source code. I'm hoping we all use version control, right? We don't just have some files on the laptop somewhere and that's our source code. So version control is a really good way of going faster because it means you can make changes and if things go bad, you can revert them, right? So version control will on the same page. Automate your deployment process. How many people do continuous delivery in the room? That's a pretty good, well played, well played you. Um, Trunk-based development. How many people do long-lived long feature branches? Long, will anybody dare admit it? So long-term feature branches are seen as not a high-performing team function. They're correlated with low to medium teams. The main reason is they slow you down because you have those merge wars that you have three long-term long branches. One team merges and the other two teams go, damn you, I've now got to merge for three days. So the idea is merge to trunk quickly, do lots of little changes, merge to trunk frequently, you don't have the merge wars anymore. So um, if you want to be a high-performing team, try not to use long-term feature branches. If you don't believe me, read the book and, and read the details. It's not me saying this, it's the book saying this, okay? Um, implement continuous integration. We all kind of want that. We all want continuous integration. Use a loosely coupled architecture. One of the findings of this year is high-performing teams use the cloud well. Now, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, yeah, I use Amazon and stuff, but a lot of people use the cloud as a pseudo data center, right? They had four machines under their desk, and then they moved those four machines to four VM on Amazon. That's not using the cloud well, right? Using the cloud well is using the cloud as an elastic, automatically scalable, managed, multi-data center, multi-availability zone way of building software. Just moving those boxes under your desk to VMs on Amazon is not using the cloud well, right? Now, if you're using microservices these days, using the cloud well is kind of synonymous with Kubernetes, which I, I, ho I hope most of you have heard of. Here's a little diagram of what Kubernetes kind of looks like. So Kubernetes is basically a way of running lots of different microservices well. In other words, you tell Kubernetes, I have these 
20 microservices, can you keep them all running, please? Then what Kubernetes will do is um, it will scale them up and down automatically if you wish, or you can manually scale them up or down. It will do all the load balancing between the microservices. It will make sure all those keep running, so you don't need uh, operations people tailing logs to check everything's up and running. Kubernetes will automatically keep your stuff running. So Kubernetes is just a way of running software reliably with elasticity on any cloud. Right? It runs on your laptop, it runs on the public cloud, it runs on Amazon, Google, Microsoft, it runs on IBM's cloud, uh, who have just bought uh, Red Hat. Um, it works on Oracle's cloud. Uh, some people use that, I think. Uh, Pivotal has something called PKS, where there's Kubernetes. So pretty much every vendor, every middleware provider, uh, every cloud provider, every op operating system or PaaS has a Kubernetes offering now. Now, right now, this year, 2018, is the year that Kubernetes officially won. And what that basically means is we now have a single way of packaging applications and running them on any cloud. Right? This is kind of pretty exciting. We've had decades of competing standards. Right? We used to have the EC2 REST API, which isn't the prettiest thing in the world, and then OpenStack, which is probably worse. Um, and that was it. And they were completely different. You had to focus on two completely different technologies. You had to work with VMs, and it was all kind of horrible. Now we have containers, Docker containers, and we have Kubernetes as a way of running software at scale on any cloud provider. So you could pick Amazon to start with, with say EKS. Um, you maybe try it for a while and try Google and realize GKE is maybe kind of more your kind of thing. Or you could move to uh, Azure because of a business decision. Or maybe you have to multi-cloud. Um, increasingly, lots of investment banks, for example, the regulators force them to use two cloud providers. So you can't just go all in on Amazon. You have to be, say, Amazon and Google or Google and Azure. So all of us now have a single cloud operating system that we can develop software for that we can then... Uh, not be locked in with the cloud vendors, right? So you can start on Amazon and then switch to Google whenever you feel like, or you can watch the prices, and at any point in time, you can just switch. Moving your database is kind of harder, but you certainly your, your Kubernetes workloads, it's trivial to switch from one to the other, right? So Kubernetes is a wonder, wonder, wonderful thing. I highly recommend you all look at it. One of the challenges, though, is now development teams have to figure out how to do microservices well, how to do Kubernetes well, how to do the cloud well, how to automate their CI and CD, and it becomes quite a lot of stuff that the development teams need to learn. So this is where this new project called Jenkins X comes in. So Jen the X is the is a crucial thing, Jenkins X. We all know Jenkins, right? Jenkins is this CI framework. It's a, a bag of Lego bricks. You can plug the Lego bricks together in any way you like to do anything you want, which is awesome. What Jenkins X is trying to do is automate those Lego bricks. So you basically just say, here's my app. Can you do CI and CD for me? And that's what Jenkins X kind of does. So Jenkins X is about automation of all of your CI and CD. So how does Jenkins X help you? So firstly, it automates the setup of all of your tools and environments. So it will set up a Jenkins server for you if you want. We have something called serverless Jenkins that I'll maybe talk about later. Um, there's various other bits and pieces on the Kubernetes platform you need to use to do uh, Kubernetes well. So things like uh, Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes. Uh, there's Nexus to store your artifacts or Artifactory to store your artifacts. There's Docker registries to put your images inside, which could be something like ECR on Amazon or GCR on Google or ACR on Azure. Or it could be something like Harbor if you like that kind of thing. Or it could be Artifactory if you've gone with Artifactory Professional. So all of these different software tools need to be glued together, right? which can take time and, and energy. Jenkins X just glues all that stuff together for you. Okay, So that's pretty cool. It also automates the CI and CD for all your applications. So for each one of these microservices, you don't have to sit there and figure out what's your Docker image, what's your Docker file like, what's your Jenkins pipeline look like, what's your Helm chart look like, um, how do you glue all that stuff together. Uh, Jenkins X automates all of that stuff. So you can just, your team could just get going really, really quickly. Finally, uh, Jenkins X performs something called GitOps. It's a way of doing promotion between environments. So every team I've ever talked to in, in my uh, quite long career, I'm really, really old, um, every team I've ever worked with, we always talk about environments. Right? You talk about code going from development to testing to staging to production. The words we use for the environments might change. One team might say pre-prod or pre-production. Some might say user acceptance testing. We'll have all these different environments that basically code moves from development to testing to staging to pre-prod to production. 
So Genghis X automates this, this promotion flow of releases using something called GitOps. And all that really means is, let's use Git as a source of truth for each environment. So, for example, the production environment will have a Git repository that lists all of the microservices that are running in that environment, which version of the uh, microservice is running, and any environment-specific configuration. So to promote between environments, we use a pull request. Now, at first, this might seem a little bit weird. Right? In Kubernetes, you have a command line, and you can connect to a, a cluster, and you can type kubectl create something, and kubectl delete everything, which is awesome. But when you're in a production environment shared by a team, you kind of don't want people doing stuff on the command line, because no one else can see you doing it. And worse, if you delete the wrong thing, no one can revert easily. Right? So using the command line in production and staging is kind of scary. So what we prefer to do is store all of that in version control in Git, so that if you need to make a change, you make a pull request, your team can review it and go, I don't think you want to delete production today. Maybe we'll do that another day. Or were you really thinking of the test environment? So rather than accidentally deleting production, which is very easy to do in Kubernetes, it gives you a chance to code review things. Or maybe you're about to change the configuration of a service, and you make that change, and it seems so innocent. So you make a little change. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? And then all of a sudden, production crashes and burns. Because it's all in Git, you can review the change and just revert it. Right? If production was totally fine and totally fine and totally fine, and then on Tuesday at 2 o'clock it goes down, you can just look at the Git log and see, ah, it was James with that innocent-looking change. Maybe we should revert that, and everything can go back to normal. So Git is a really lovely tool, not just for source code to build your application, but to promote your application through the environments. Okay? So um, it's I'll, I'll do a demo in about kind of five minutes if the internet works and if Google Cloud and GitHub stay up for the next 10 minutes. Um, but here's how to install and get going. So we have a little binary called JX, which is a little command line tool. It's a small, simple binary that we have a Windows version, a Linux version, and a Mac version. So just download the binary for your platform. Um, then you've got two choices to get to create Jenkins X. The first one is this command, JX create cluster G GKE. The last word here is the name of the is the kind of cluster you want to create. So GKE uses Google Cloud, so that's going to create a Kubernetes cluster on Google Cloud using your credentials. Um, we have a whole bunch of other options there. So you could use EKS, EKS for Amazon, COPS. Well, AWS will use COPS on Amazon if you want to use the classic way of doing uh, Kubernetes on Amazon, whereas EKS is the new shiny uh, strategic way. Uh, AKS works on Amazon. We have IKS for IBM Cloud, PKS for Pivotal Cloud. <sighs> what else do we have? We have OpenShift for Red Hat's Cloud. <sighs> We've probably got some more that I've forgotten right now. I'm sure there's some more. So basically, pick the cloud you like or you want to use and, and use the verb uh, or noun that you want to use in, in JX Create Cluster. So JX Create Cluster and then one of those options. If you can't remember the options, just miss. GKE off and hit carriage return, and you get a list of all the different clouds you could create. So the create cluster one, that will use the cloud provider's APIs to spin up a new Kubernetes cluster, then it will install Jenkins X on top of it. Okay? This is our preferred approach because it means we know when we create that cluster, it's going to be set up in a nice way, so everything's going to work for Jenkins X. If someone's already made you a Kubernetes cluster, you can use JX install. So if somebody says, hey, here's a Kubernetes cluster, do you want to use it? You go, oh, yes, let me put Jenkins X on there, and then I can do CI and CD. So you'll use JX install. The only thing is, there's a lot of different ways of making a Kubernetes cluster. So the cluster could be too small. It might, be, it might not have ingress or persistence, or load balancers might not work, kind of work. So while this one can and does work often, the create cluster is kind of our preferred, because then we know everything's set up correctly for the different cloud providers. Um, so basically, use one of those two, ideally the top one. Um, another quick uh, getting started tip, try and avoid Minikube. I know Minikube sounds like a nice idea. Most people struggle to get that working. And then worse, once you try running lots of stuff in Minikube, it tends to fall over, your laptop becomes unresponsive. The whole idea of CI CD is for a team to work together using the cloud. So it, I'd recommend going straight to the cloud, pick a cloud, any cloud, and do it on the cloud first. 
just because you probably want to work with your uh, colleagues together on a project. And once you've got CI CD working for a couple of repos, you want to work together on, on Git repositories and pull requests and so forth. So highly recommend use a real cloud if you can. If you want, just use one of the free tiers. Most of the clouds has a free tier. So you can spin everything up on the free tier, use it for a couple of days, and then tear it down if you're worried about having to pay for anything. Um, ideally, you can find someone in your organization who has a credit card who can maybe expense you know, a couple of hundred bucks a month, and then you've got an awesome CI CD platform. But worst case, just run it for a couple of weeks and then tear it down to kick the tires. OK. Uh, shall I show you? Yeah, let me show you that. No, I'm not going to show you that. Uh, I could show you. Oh, go on now. I'll show you it. Here's a very quick video of installing on uh, GKE in this case, but they all look about the same. You type J, it's great, cluster GKE at the top. It asks you for what kind of zone do you want, wish to use, what kind of nodes do you wish to use, what's the min max number of nodes. Then boom, it spins up a Kubernetes cluster, then it sets up ingress, then it asks for a couple of Git repositories. We'll talk about those Git repo re repos in a minute. And then a few minutes later, boom, you're done. Um, on Google Cloud, it takes about two minutes from uh, zero to having a fully functioning Jenkins X uh, with a Kubernetes cluster. On uh, Amazon, it's about 20 minutes at the minute. Um, all the cloud providers kind of change in how quickly they work. Uh, so leave yourself, say, let's say an hour. Within an hour on any cloud provider, you'll be up and running. But GKE is really, really quick. If, you, if you're short on time, just use GKE. It's super, super fast. Um, and that's it. So it's one command. One command to create a Kubernetes cluster with Jenkins X on top, which is cool. Right. Uh, so what does that give you? Once you've done the JX create cluster or the JX install, whichever one of those two, what happens? So the idea is each team has their own development environment where the development tools will run. So things like Jenkins, things like Nexus, various other bits and pieces. But let's go with those two main things for now. Um, also, each team gets their own elastic pool of build pods. So in other words, if you've ever used Jenkins before and you have like agents or executors or all those kind of things, they're often of a limited size. With Jenkins X, you have an elastic pool, so you can run literally as many builds as your Kubernetes cluster can cope with. And most clusters can auto-scale up with load, so you can just keep doing whatever builds you want. So there's not this big build queue where all of your team are fighting with each other to get builds done. And you don't do that sneaky thing of deleting the builds or cancelling builds, you know. Who deleted my build? You know, anyways. So you don't have to do the fighting of getting a build. So everyone's got an elastic build. The other thing is every team gets a staging environment and a production environment. And this is really important. In the microservices world, one of the whole points of microservices is so that every team can just go forwards and deliver value quickly and independently, right? So each team shouldn't have to ask, can I please release some software right now? Each team should have staging and production, so you can immediately release to staging and choose when to go to production. Okay? Uh, I'll show you the production and uh, the promotion in, in, in a few moments. Now, you can create as many environments as you wish per team, right? It's completely up to you. But out of the box, we default to one staging environment and one production environment. And we default to staging promotion being automatic. So every time we do a release, we automatically promote to staging. And we've left it a manual step to go from staging to production. Now, you can choose to have as many environments as you wish. and make. We want you to be completely automatic as soon as possible, really. Um, but we kind of figure this is a fairly nice uh, middle ground that people get used to going to staging automatically. And then when they're ready, they can move from staging to production with one simple command. So that's what we get by default. Uh, then how do you use it? Like Once you have all this capability, what do you do kind of next? So again, there's one command to do all the funky stuff, and it's one of these three commands. Now, I recommend you start at the bottom of the commands. I should have flipped the order on this slide. I apologize. Um, for example, if you're a Java person and you like to do Spring Boot, which is pretty much the most popular framework for doing microservices in the JVM right now, do JX create Spring at the bottom. And that will create a brand new Spring Boot application using the start.spring.io um, framework, the Spring Initializer thingy. So it will create a brand new Spring Boot application, spin, spin it up in a Git repository, set up all the webhooks and stuff, and set up all of your CI and CD. If you're not a Spring Boot kind of guy, then JX create Quick Start. That will spin up a brand new Quick Start using a whole bunch of different uh, Quick Start templates. So in, say, Node, Angular, Go, Python, PHP, .NET, uh, Gradle, Maven. So there's a whole bunch of sample projects that you can just pick the language or runtime or framework you like. It will make an example pro project of that. And then again, set up the CI and CD. 
There's also, if you already have some source code, there's JX import, and JX import will import your source code into Genghis X, set up the CI and CD for you, and then you should be good to go. Now, one thing about source code is people can do all kinds of crazy stuff in source code. So it's hard for us to guarantee that JX import is always going to work. So we recommend when you're just kicking the tires of Genghis X, start with one of these two things at the bottom, because they will always work, right? Or they should always work. And if they don't work, there's something wrong with your Kubernetes cluster, probably. Or, or you found a bug. But probably it's, it's something wrong with your Kubernetes cluster. So if these two things work, you know your cluster's set up, everything's good, Genghis X is working well, and then if JX import doesn't work, you know, maybe there's some issue with this source code, and maybe you could compare your source code for, I don't know, say a Spring Boot app to one of the example Spring Boot apps and go, am I doing something weird in my palm or something? Like, why have I bro broken the build pack? So try one of these two things just to find your feet, and then go on to JX import if you have an existing code base. Right, so let's do a live demo. Let me just see how long I've got left. Oh, not, not long. OK, let's go to a live demo. So I'm going to do a live demo on Google Cloud, and I'm going to use GitHub for my source control. We do support lots of different Git providers. Oh, no, don't do that. Uh, install and quit. OK, phew. OK, um, let me clear this. Can you read the text at the back of the room? Or shall I, does it need to be a bit bigger? A bit bigger? Let me make it a bit bigger. Welcome to this short demonstration to show how we can use Jenkins X to automate CI and CD on Kubernetes. So I've already installed Jenkins X on Google Cloud. If I type JX get end, we'll see we've got three environments, development, staging, and production for my team. Um, if I type JX get app, you can see we've got no applications deployed at all right now. Okay, so let's clear my screen. Um, let's create a brand new Spring Boot application. So JX create Spring, we'll create a brand new Spring Boot application. We pick which programming language we wish to use. I'll go with Java. Uh, which group ID? We'll go with the default. Let's give this a funky name. JX is awesome. Uh, which Spring Boot dependencies do we wish to use? We'll pick web and actuator. Uh, it's going to use my GitHub name. I'll use the default commit, commit message. So now it's going to create the project, initialize a Git repository. Um, now it's going to, once it's created a Git repository, it's going to push that up to my Git provider, which is GitHub. It's going to pick which project, which o o owner do we wish to use. I'll go with my personal one. What repository name? I'll go with Jake's is awesome. So now it's going to push the source code up into GitHub. Um, and once it's pushed the source code to GitHub, it's going to set up all the CI and CD pipelines for this project. So you'll see, if I click on this URL, we'll see here's the Git repository. Uh, the Git repo we've just created with the normal um, Spring Boot uh, source code, uh, which has all come from the start.spring.io Spring Boot initializer. So it's a canonical Hello World Spring application. You might also notice we've run the Jenkins X build pack. So we've generated a bunch of extra files, like a Docker file, a Jenkins file, some Helm charts, uh, and scaffold. So it's a canonical Spring Boot application, but it's got all the files necessary to set up all the CI and CD pipelines and package things up as a Docker image and deploy them into Kubernetes via Helm. Now, you don't need to worry about the contents of any of these source code files, but if you really care and you really want to tweak the Docker file or the Jenkins file or the scaffold or the uh, Helm charts, you can just edit the code. It's all in GitHub. So we don't hide anything. We're not wrapping anything. Everything's right there in Git. But most of the time, you can just focus on your application source code and ignore all these metadata files that, that do the, the detail of CI and CD. So uh, if I type this magic command here, we'll be able to watch what's happening in the pipeline. So we'll see, because we've pushed the source code to GitHub and we pushed to the master branch, it's already triggered the release pipeline. So you can see the pipeline one on master for JX is awesome is chugging along. So we're now going to be checking the source code out from Git, uh, running all the tests and check everything com compiles. We're going to generate, in this case, a, a, a jar, an executable jar, because it's Spring Boot. We're going to package up that executable jar uh, as a Docker image, push that to the Docker registry. Then we're going to make an immutable uh, Helm chart. Again, the, everything's going to be tagged with a new version, 001. The next time we do the same thing, it'll be 002. If ever you wish to jump ahead in version numbers, you can either explicitly tag the repository yourself with, say, 100, that the next release will be 101 and so forth. So the release pipeline is doing the release of all the immutable infrastructure. Um, if I click on the Releases tab, 
if we, we've created a tag right now. So we've tagged automatically all the sources 001. So each release gets its own version number and the tag. Uh, and in a few moments time, we'll generate the change log uh, and then we'll start the promotion through GitOps. So we've typed in one command and uh, it's automatically set up the Git repository, all the webhooks and all the pipelines to do CI and CD. So I'll give this another moment or two, and this should hopefully complete the release. Incidentally, if you want to look at this uh, using the traditional Jenkins console, if I open a new tab and I type JX console, this will open Jenkins. There we go, and there's Jenkins. Um, let me close, switch back to this tab now. Uh, and you can see that this is the Jenkins JX is awesome pipeline. Uh, this is the project that's been created. And if I look at it in the Jenkins console, you can see the release has been performed, and now it's starting to uh, promote to the environments. You'll see the same thing in the command line, if you're a command line kind of person, so you can see uh, release 001 has been completed and now it's starting to promote. So we've got the 001 release and now we're promoting to our environments. Uh, you'll see now we've created a pull request. Uh, just before we go there, I'll just show you if I reload this page, we've generated a nice change log, which has details of all the changes we've done and all the commits that have happened. So we've got a nice change log with links to the source code and everything. Um, if I click on this URL for the pull request, we'll see this is a pull request which is used to promote 001 into the staging environment. So notice this is a staging repository. So in Jenkins X, each environment gets its own Git repository, and that repository stores all of the metadata for which applications are going to be running in staging or production. So Jenkins X, to promote JX is awesome to the staging environment 001, we've generated this pull request, which makes this change. And here's the change. So we've added three lines of YAML to the requirements.yaml file, which is a standard held chat file. So we've added the new uh, application. That's the name of the application. That's the, uh, that's the uh, chart repository, and this is the version. So we've generated a pull request with three lines in it. The reason it's three lines is because this is the first time we've ever deployed this application. The next time we go to 001, it will just change one line, which is the version from 001 to 002. So notice because we've generated a pull request, that's also triggered a new CI pipeline, which has validated the check, the, the validated the pull request, checked that the image is valid, checked that the Helm chart is correct, and so forth. And you can see that the CI job completed and this pull request merged. So we've now merged the change to the staging environment. So that's all automatically merged for us, which is great. So now another pipeline is triggered on the master branch of the staging environment Git repository, which is going to actually apply this change so that we've proposed the change via Git, via GitOps. Uh, the change has been approved via CI, and then it's going to trigger another pipeline, which is going to uh, merge the change. And if you look here, you can see the pull request has been merged. So that's all good. And now the update uh, to the environment is now triggered. Uh, if you click into Jenkins, we'll see, if you go into the uh, homepage of Jenkins, we'll see uh, there's a pipeline running the staging. There's the pipeline running the staging environment. And the staging environment pipeline is going to uh, apply this uh, JX command, which is going to apply the Helm chart in the environment. So in a moment or two, this application will be deployed to staging. So what's basically just happened, we typed one command. We've created a brand new project. It's automated all the CI and the CD for the project. Uh, whenever we merge to master, we create a new immutable uh, release, both from a jar, a palm, a docket image, and a Helm chart. Then we promote this version to whichever environments we wish. By default, it automatically goes to the staging environment. And as soon as this pipeline finishes, your application should be running live in the staging environment. And there you see the pipeline is finished. Uh, if I look back here, we can see the whole pipeline for version one is complete. And we'll see there's a little URL here. If I click on that URL, we'll see the application is now running in the staging environment. Um, I can also type JX get app, and we can see all the applications that are running in this case in the staging environment. So we can see JX awesome version 001 is running one pod and it's running in the staging environment here. And if I click on that URL, we can see here's the Hello World application for Spring running in the staging environment. So we type one command, we created a brand new Spring Boot application, and it's automatically done a release and moved this to the staging environment by GitOps promotion. Now we can create pull requests on the, uh, this application to try out changes. 
So let's go into the uh, source code. JX is awesome. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy a magic file from my uh, desktop um, to the source folder. I need to make that recursive copy. There we go. If I do a git status, we've added a file. So git add all these files. Oops, sorry, too many sources. We'll add this file to git. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add um, a new file status because the home the home page isn't too hot right now. This is the the default home page you get with the Spring Boot application. So let's add a new home page. Uh, let's also create a new issue. Create issue. Uh, improve home page. So we'll create an issue so it's easy to track what's going on. Uh, so there's a new issue being created in GitHub. Now I'm going to create a branch, git uh, checkout minus b changes. And uh, what I want to do is make my changes on a branch so that I can then make a pull request and we can do all of our changes through a pull request so we can keep master clean and only merge to master when the pull request works. So if I do a git commit, minus a minus m, uh, fix home page, uh, and it fixes issue number one. There we go, and git push. So we've pushed that to our new branch. There we go. And if I do JX repo, that's going to open the Git repository because I've forgotten where it was. And we'll see GitHub is telling us, would I like to create a pull request for this? So we say, oh, yes, please. Let me resize this bit. Compare and um, create a pull request. Yes, let's create a pull request. Fix home page. Yeah, that looks good. Create a pull request. So I made a fairly simple code change, and I've created a pull request on this repository I've just created. Now you should see in a few moments, um, let's shrink this web page down a little bit. Um, you should see in a few moments the CI pipeline should trigger. So we, we saw previously that there's a release pipeline that triggers whenever we uh, merge to the master branch. We also have pull request pipelines that whenever we create a pull request, we automatically create a, a pipeline for pull requests. And what that does is that runs CI and all of your pull requests to check. Does the code compile? Uh, do the test till, still pass? Have you kind of broken anything? Uh, we also do for something else where we create a preview environment so we can test out our changes live uh, in Kubernetes. And you can see the pull request is just completed. So you see the CI job has gone green. All the checks have passed, so we're ready to merge whenever we've reviewed this. And notice this says pull request built and available in this preview environment. So if I click on that link in the new tab, there we go, there's a link. This is the preview. So deployed the pull request code before we've merged. And this is the new application running. You can see in the URL, this is the pull request. This is the name of the application. This is repository. So pull request is now running live in this preview environment. So we can validate the code, check it looks good. Is that a better homepage? Yes, it is. So we can review the code as a team, give feedback when we're all happy. Someone could click merge and then we can merge the change. And now this is going to trigger a new release. So we've merged into the master. Uh, so if I now do the JX get activity, um, we'll see uh, pipeline number two is about to start. There we go. Pipeline two is triggering along. So now we're about to release 002. So we set up a brand new application with one command. We've created a pull request that's automatically validated the pull request. It's used a preview environment so we can review the changes. Uh, and this is all automated completely for you. So we've got releases and preview environments on pull requests, all from one single command to create a new Spring Boot application in Jenkins X. Pretty cool. Let me tell you what's actually happened behind the scenes. So when DNS is working, what happens is we create the GitHub uh, image, we, get, we create the Git repository, we set up all the webhooks, we set up the Jenkins pipeline job, then we trigger a Jenkins pipeline job, then Jenkins then triggers a release pipeline on the master branch, which creates a new version. It creates tags the source code. It creates a Docker image with that tag, with that version tag. It creates a Helm chart with that version. Then it deploys it into the staging environment using GitOps. Right? We, every time you push to master, we create a brand new version. So we create a new version number using semantic versions. 
Um, if ever you want to go from 001 to 100, you can just git tag the repository, and it will then go 100, 101, and so forth. Um, let's see if it's come back yet. No, it's not come back. Why would that not work? It always works. All right, let me try something uh, uh, wacky. Let me uh, 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 uh. let me do the restart the ingress pod. See if that helps. Let's do that one. I should have had a chance to try my demo in the car. <laughs> See if this works. Yeah, ingress isn't working. Okay, let me keep talking about what actually happens on the covers. And I will post a video uh, immediately after this on Slack uh, to, and, and Twitter to show you what really happens. So um, we ultimately set up, normally when ingress is working, we set up CI and CD. So whenever we merge to master, we create a brand new release. Then whenever you create a pull request, we create a preview environment. So we run all the usual CI and CD tests. So we check, does this pull request, does the code compile? Um, can I run this in a Docker image on Kubernetes? We then deploy a preview environment to a new namespace. So whenever you create a pull request, we will run your code live in Kubernetes. We'll comment on the pull request with a URL of where your ap application is running. So if you're working on, say, a web application, um, we'll generate a new version of the web application running in a separate environment so your team can review what the change looks like before you merge to master. One of the aims of microservices is to go fast. So what we want to do is verify your code changes are all valid before we merge to master. Once you've merged to master, master is then potentially broken, right? So we want to put as much as the testing at the pull request level so that once you merge to master, you know it's good to go and you can pretty much go straight to staging, right? When we first started making Jenkins X, we kind of thought we should do it the classic way, where when you merge to master, we do a release, then that release goes through testing. The problem with doing it that way is you've only got one master branch, right? So if you move that through testing, maybe there's an issue. Maybe you, you test it for three days and you find there's a bug. The problem is you might want, you might have one code change that's changing the background color. Another code change could be um, fixing an emergency bug fix. So master is like this uh, single track. As soon as you have one thing on master, it could take a very long time to test. You could have broken master in the meantime. So you can't do another pull request, or you can't merge another pull request until you're sure that's valid. So it's better to do all of your testing on the pull request stage, so you can concurrently test everything on preview environments. Uh, very quickly, uh, Jenkins X2. Um, is coming along soon where we use a serverless Jenkins engine, which means you don't have to keep a Jenkins master running all the time, and we'll just spin up a Jenkins for each pod um, as and when you need to do a build. Uh, if ever you use Helm, by the way, on Kubernetes, Tiller is not awesome. So it's a good idea to not run Tiller. So there's an option with Jenkins X of turning off Tiller. Tiller is like a server side thing in, in uh, Helm. Don't worry too much about that. But if anybody says, let's use Helm, don't use Tiller. Friends don't let friends use Tiller. We're using something called Prow, which adds a webhook handler, which, which adds chat ops onto your pull requests. So once a pull request is raised, you can have conversations about like which test suites do we want to run on this pull request. Do we run do we want to run just unit tests? Do we want to do unit plus regression tests plus soak tests plus load tests? So it gives you a way of having a conversation with your team to decide what suite of tests you wish to use on each pull request. I'm out of time. OK. And then finally, uh, that's how Jenkins dash X. So remember, Jenkins dash X dot IO is the website. If you go there, there's live videos on there that show you how it all works when uh, Ingress is working properly. And I apologize, my demo didn't work. And if you go to the community link, which is on the front, there's a link to the Slack room. We're all hanging out in Slack all the time. If you've got any questions about Jenkins X, uh, I'm sure you can install it better than I just did. Uh, so try out Jenkins X and uh, l give us some feedback. Any questions before I get chucked off the stage? That was pretty much Jenkins X. So it automates CI and CD on any Kubernetes cluster, and it's awesome. And it usually always works, apart from today. <laughs> any questions? Thank you. Thank you.